I am talking uh, about um, one area of my more recent research on the expanding spectrum of interferonopathies. And you've heard of two cases uh, this morning uh, that point out the importance of being able to recognize um, and diagnose these patients, the uh, two SPENS uh, D patients that were actually, let me see how it can advance. I have no disclosures. I'll talk about the role of interferon in uh, autoinflammatory diseases, and I will focus on CANDLE, uh, PRAS, proteosome-associated autoinflammatory disease, SAVI and AGS, and novel interferonopathies that share clinical features. Um, the, I will talk about the pathomechanisms that drive type 1 interferonopathies um, and uh, the interferon signature as a screening tool and challenges uh, of treatment. Well, autoinflammatory diseases are caused by mutations. This is the landscape of the innate immune sensors on the cell surface and within the cytoplasm. And here's the nucleus. And um, the um, autoinflammatory diseases are caused by mutations in genes that encode or regulate um, cytoplasmic um, germline encoded pattern recognition receptors and their pathways. And they are part of the uh, innate immune surveillance system. And you have heard earlier of a patient with FCAS who actually has a gain of function mutation in the NLRP3 inflammasome um, that um, constitutively or upon cold exposure leads to the release of interleukin 1 and the inflammatory syndromes. But in addition to those, there are actually mutations in the viral sensors that are coupled to the production of interferon, um, as well as, uh, so these are, this is a viral sensor, as well as um, proteosomes um, that are um, um, protein degradation units that degrade proteins, as well as um, um, mutations in nucleases uh, that um, um, metabolize uh, nucleic acids that lead to a whole new group um, of conditions um, that are uh, called interf autoinflammatory interferonopathies and um, present with a high um, interferon dysregulation. Um, you've also heard that um, immunodeficiencies with loss of function mutations in interferon signaling pathways lead to infections. Now, these conditions are thought of too much. There is continuous uh, interferon signaling and the presence of a blood interferon signature has during an active disease has in fact become uh, the hallmark of diagnosing uh, these immune dysregulatory conditions. Um, so, Measuring an interferon score had initially been thought to be a readout for interferon that is in the serum. And interferons, when released, um, signal through the interferon receptor and lead to the transcription of interferon-stimulated or interferon response genes. These ones are measured. But we are learning more and more that a number of the mutations that cause these interferonopathies lead to intracellular stress and signatures that basically uh, lead to the transcription of interferon response genes that then can be amplified by interferons. So they're actually, um, uh, this is still an area of investigation in these intracellular stress pathways that lead uh, to the production uh, of interferon response genes and interferons and the clinical phenotype are subject of active investigation. We have, um, two interferon systems, type 1 interferon and type 3 interferons. There are 11 interferon alphas and one interferon beta that signal to the type 1 interferon receptor. And then um, there are type 3 interferon or the uh, lambda interferons um, that uh, signal through the type 3 interferon receptor that is made of, uh, it's a heterodimer. And they basically um, activate the same downstream pathways and lead to the uh, production of or transcription of interferon response genes. And then there's interferon gamma, which basically drives uh, a set of interferon gamma mediated uh, interferon response genes. And they can be vastly overlapping, but actually um, they can also be distinguished um, um, at, uh, at several levels. So the genes we've selected are actually response genes that are quite specific to type 1 interferon signaling, although they are partially 
and to lower levels uh, also um, uh, upregulated by type 2 interference. We can quantify those in a nanostring assay, and they have actually become a fast readout uh, for the presence of interferon signaling in these patients. Interferons drive and amplify innate and adaptive immune responses. And uh, chronic interferon signaling is also seen in a subset of patients um, with um, monogenic uh, lupus. Now, a typical lupus phenotype is actually seen in a monogenic form um, in patients who have mutations in the complement system, in DNA clearance mecha me um, uh, mechanisms, or um, in uh, B cell signaling. There are a number of immunodeficiencies um, that dysregulate T and B cell function and present with features of autoimmunity, uh, usually cytokine, uh, cytopenias and autoantibodies. Um, these, um, there is another group of auto, um, uh, uh, primary autoimmune diseases that are caused or associated with um, disease-specific uh, autoantibodies. And then there are metabolic conditions that, again, uh, lead to T and B cell dysregulation and um, some lymphoproliferative conditions uh, that present with autoimmunity. Um, in contrast, the autoinflammatory conditions um, um, are um, have been revealing um, mechanisms that actually help us understand the actual production um, of, uh, of interferons, and I'll actually expand on those um, in a minute. Now, neutrophil activation is present in both conditions in autoinflammatory and autoimmune diseases, and um, the production of interferon by neutrophils amplifies um, both processes. Um, furthermore, I'd like to actually uh, pose that the mechanisms that cause autoinflammatory uh, conditions have been very instrumental in uh, telling us um, about uh, the organ manifestations and damage that we see in these uh, conditions. Um, there are candle and savvy mimics, um, and I'll briefly touch on those as well. But let me introduce you to the three clinical phenotypes um, that have helped uh, to sort out um, um, other conditions that have more recently been found. Um, the first disease um, is candle or chronic atypical neutrophilic dermatosis with lipoatrophy, elevated temperatures, and it's also termed um, um, proteosome associated autoinflammatory syndrome, or PRAS. These patients present early in life with nodular rashes um, and um, it, they, that are enodosome like on biopsy. They have paniculitis um, that actually causes lipodystrophy, and um, you can see the loss of fat um, that occurs usually uh, second or third uh, age, uh, year of life. And um, patients have um, uh, a myositis that is patchy uh, in contrast to dermatomyositis. Uh, many develop metabolic syndrome here with fat accumulation around the kidneys um, and are very, uh, that uh, happens on steroids. And they have basal ganglion calcifications, which actually has become a hallmark. And you have actually seen a picture of um, in the ACP patient before. Soft tissue calcifications can also be present. Untreated, the mortality uh, is uh, 20%. Um, Patients um, present with systemic inflammation. It's actually seen in uh, most patients and with um, hematologic um, abnormalities. Uh, most patients have arthritis uh, and myositis and develop contractures and um, atrophy um, and uh, metabolic features include hepatic steatosis that needs to be actually searched for. And insidious is the development of primary pulmonary hypertension that um, is present in the absence of interstitial lung disease. Um, neutrophilia, thrombocytosis, and later in chronic disease, thrombocytopenia and lymphopenia can ensure, and uh, many patients um, have um, growth delay and short status. 
Um, there are a number of um, genetic mutations and five forms of, produce, uh, pro of uh, proteasome associated autoinflammatory syndrome or candle that are known. The genes are listed here. The majority, um, more than 70% of known patients, um, have autosomal loss of function mutations in PSMB8. Um, they are often um, familial and um, in uh, founder populations. Um, the uh, proteasome mutations are linked to the ubiquitin proteasome system um, and lead to uh, interferon production. The um, proteasome is absolutely essential and loss of function in any of the constitutive component or complete absence, not just loss, not loss of function, absence is incompatible with life. So the proteasome is actually like a tubule and it has like a garbage can and opening and it is able to process polyubiquitated proteins um, by degrading them uh, through, uh, through um, proteases into cleave peptides. And they are therefore a recycling unit um, that is absolutely critical. Um, if dysfunction occurs, there is accumulation of polyubiquitated proteins in the cytoplasm. Um, in addition to compound or homozygous and compound heterozygous cases, there are a number of uh, proteasome components that cause the disease in a diagenic um, disease model with a monogenic defect in one proteasome allele and uh, 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 one in another. Um, and you can uh, see there are uh, a number of um, core molecules that have now been described uh, to um, cause the disease but also two molecules that guide the assembly, POMP and PSMG2 of that um, molecular um, tubule. Um, the function of the proteasome um, is actually still uh, under investigation. Um, there are some early reports um, that um, the proteotoxic stress that gets released um, by the ER and cannot get degraded by the proteasome uh, accumulates uh, in the cytoplasm uh, that has been shown multiple times. It is unclear what the sensor for this proteotoxic stress is that actually links its accumulation uh, to the production of type 1 interferon. Um, and I hope that I will be able to present uh, this to you in the not uh, too distant future. Um, we do know that there is an integrated stress response um, that can be induced um, by uh, various causes, including hypoxia, metabolic disrangements, uh, ER stress, and so on, that is upregulated in patients with candle. But again, we are missing uh, the connections. The second proteotypic disease that I'd like to introduce to you is sting-associated vasculopathy with onset uh, in infancy. And um, this um, disease is autosomal dominant. It mainly occurs sporadic, or uh, but can be familial in mild in milder cases. And over eighty patients have so far been um, identified. Um, patients present early on life um, with rashes, usually in cold exposed areas, including the acral surfaces. Um, and respiratory symptoms can be the presenting features in patients with less peripheral vascular disease. Um, the disease, the peripheral vascular disease is caused by a vasculitis. You can see the fibrinoid necrosis and the infiltration of neutrophils of the vessel that gets completely destroyed. Um, and acutely in young children can lead to acute gangrene uh, or chronically in older patients uh, to progressive loss of digits. Um, the mortality is linked to the severe lung disease and uh, similar to candle uh, is around 20% if untreated. Um, hematologic and immunologic um, features include, uh, include anemia, thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, hypergamma globulinemia, and growth delay. Um, the cytopenias actually occur in the context of disease flares, which is in contrast to, to the IL-1 mediated diseases where usually thrombocyte counts and white blood cell counts um, and lymphocyte counts are stable and the others are actually elevated during flares. So that can be sometimes in early children with systemic inflammation and rashes and fever, uh, a, 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 a feature that can help you to differentiate early. 
Um, there is phenotypic variability in SAVI. Um, we recently have seen and uh, reported um, three novel mutation in STING. The majority are actually in exon four, um, but we found a family with mutations in exon three, and uh, the other exons um, that carry disease causing mutations are six and seven. Um, this disease is milder, and it had actually occurred in a mother and her two children. And um, you can see the dystrophic finger changes over time, the tapering of the fingers here, on the, um, and also um, the loss. Uh, of tissue of the foot um, and dystrophic nail changes that occur over time. This is uh, a singular case um, of a child with very similar features and in all both instances there is minimal lung disease. What actually has been surprising is that the interferon signature in whole blood was negative in the three family members of family two and on multiple occasions one time low positive in the child uh, that I introduced to you. However, when we uh, looked at PBMCs, we found a strong induction of the interferon response gene signature, which was mimicked in um, by SAVI patients who actually have um, uh, constitutively expressed high interferon response gene signatures. However, if you take um, healthy patient's blood um, and you compare uh, whole blood versus PBMCs, there is no induction, suggesting that these cells may be pre-primed um, and may actually um, trigger an interferon response um, induced by the FICOL stress, um, something that uh, we need to further understand and investigate. How does STEAM get activated? CGAS is a viral sensor that senses double-stranded um, DNA, not only viral, but also cell DNA, and upon activation, releases a dinucleotide um, CGAM um, that um, activates STING, which aggregates, translocates um, uh, uh, into, um, um, uh, actually at the Golgi activates um, kinases, TBK1 and IRF3 that translocate into the nucleus and transcribe um, interferon beta, which can be used as a readout um, of uh, sting activity. Now, sting can also function as a sensor. There are a number of dinucleotides that get directly released from viruses and are actually present in the cytoplasm um, as homeostatic um, dipeptides, um, and they can actually activate the sting pathway as well. Now, this looks like a busy slide, but cryo-electron microscopy structure has solved the structure of sting, which actually allows us to place the mutations that we have observed into the sting dimer. So sting actually forms a dimer. The yellow part is one um, monomer and uh, the green part another one. And this looks a lot easier. So you see a dimer that is formed and the mutations actually occur in multiple regions in uh, the connector um, helix loop, which is in red, in a polymerization um, interface, um, actually um, where a negative regulator is binding. And recently we actually identified um, a mutation in the transmembrane uh, linker region. And what happens is, um, when sting is wild type, it needs to actually bind to CGAMP, and then it actually undergoes a 180 degree rotation. You see that the green part of the dimer moves to the other side, and there's release of uh, an inhibitor, uh, a C-terminal tail that actually binds and inhibits uh, that, um, um, that move and the oligomerization. Um, multiple um, dimers oligomerize um, and actually then recruit um, TBK1, that's the kinase that activates the downstream pathway. And we found that mutations um, in the, um, in the uh, transmembrane region is actually supposed to be further down, um, release that inhibitory signal and allow the dimerization without um, with um, a rotation occurring, but mutations um, in, in the supporting arm uh, that lead to milder disease actually allow for um, oligomerization of the dimer without the 180 degree oligomerization. Why is that important? Because we believe that sting is a great target that can be drugged and understanding the activation mechanism will be important. I can tell you here, all these models shows that um, the mutant sting can oligomerize in the absence of a ligand. 
So any drugs that would actually try to prevent oligomerization by, um, um, by uh, mimicking a ligand that can't activate would fail uh, to treat our patients. So it is very important in understanding the activation pathways. I won't go much into that, but what is very fascinating is the development of interstitial lung disease that is also seen in other auto, um, in, in a number of autoimmune diseases. And um, SAVI is the only among uh, the three prototypic um, interferonopathies that is presented presents with interstitial lung disease. What happens is shown on this on these histo slides, which are cuts through the alveolar sac, and you can actually see the thickening of the alveolar membrane in compared to, um, to a healthy control. You can also see um, that there is fibrosis of the endothelial cells of the alveolar um, vessels that you can see here, and they actually stain uh, with uh, a small muscle antigen, and we believe uh, are critical in driving the fibrosis. So in collaboration with Manfred Böhm's lab, um, who's made IPS cells, we've been able to derive um, uh, uh, um, IPS cell-derived um, endothelial cells that actually when carrying the SAVI mutation differentiate into fibroblasts, but when we repair uh, the SAVI mutation, uh, the cells actually maintain um, a nice uh, um, endothelial phenotype and do not undergo uh, a mesenchymal uh, transition. Um, I won't go into the pathways, but that is an exciting area and allows us to actually understand uh, pathways that lead to organ damage. The third um, uh, disease that um, is prototypic is Icardiogenia syndrome. Uh, recently, two additional mutations have been found, so there are actually nine forms uh, of Icardiogenia syndrome. These these patients mainly present uh, with a torch-like disease. Um, um, uh, torch uh, is basically conditions that mimic toxoplasmosis uh, or, uh, or others like syphilis, varicella, mumps, parvo, HIV, rubella, uh, CMV, and herpes. Um, and uh, these patients obviously have um, sterile inflammation and are mainly seen by neurologists. Um, they present later in life with developmental delay with loss of uh, de uh, developed milestones and with a really uh, characteristic calcifying leukoencephalopathy. So you see the, uh, the uh, calcifying uh, deposits in the basal ganglia, but you also see a massive white matter disease, a feature that is absent in candle and Savi, um, uh, although the basal ganglion calcifications can be more discreet and similar to what we see in candle and savi. Patients do present with chilled Blains lesions, but however, they don't have much systemic inflammation, if any. The majority um, can present with autoimmune phenotypes um, and are autoantibody positive, uh, usually low titers, and intermittently they can present with pneumonitis, autoimmune hepatitis that should be sought for. That's actually quite common in that disease. And uh, cytopenias, the most common mutation is RNAs H2B. Um, we've actually two patients that mimic candle but had very mild spastic or neurologic signs and uh, on MRI had white matter disease and were actually then diagnosed uh, with Icardiogenia syndrome. The most severe um, and uh, presenting with early onset disease is caused by mutations in TREX1. Um, this is uh, usually uh, the disease is recessive in most instances, uh, except uh, for ADA, uh, but um, um, for IFIH1. But autosomal dominant milder mutations in IFIH1 or in TREX1 are associated with uh, lupus. Uh, in driving actually interferon production in lupus. So these conditions have actually taught us a lot. The mutations are in genes that are endo or exonucleases and process self RNA um, and uh, DNA, or mainly self DNA, um, but uh, in one case also RNA. Now, what we have learned by studying the metabolism of nucleic acids is that the endogenous sources can come from many places, including mitochondrial DNA from micronuclei from cell DNA. And you're all aware of uh, the microbial DNA that actually enters a cell. Now, interestingly, self and microbial DNA and RNA um, act through the same viral sensors, through CGAS for double-stranded uh, DNA and uh, RIGI 
I actually is not showing here for um, for RNA uh, uh, that actually is sensed. So Sting um, translocates um, to um, from the uh, to to the um, um, Golgi, where it actually is active, and we talked about uh, its release or its triggering of um, uh, type one interferon. More recently, um, um, mutations in um, in two genes that actually process um, um, replication dependent histone pre messenger RNA. So basically, messenger RNA that actually encodes um, histones. Um, have um, been shown um, to lead to disorganized metabolism um, of these histones and actually attract uh, C-gas, which is uh, the sensor um, for much of the cell DNA and triggers an interferon response. So this was the latest addition, actually an exciting addition of, um, um, of genes that cause Icardi Gaudia syndrome uh, by uh, Yannick Groh, who has done uh, a tremendous work of uh, dissecting the genetics of uh, Icardi Gaudia syndrome. So to summarize again, um, the three me me um, mechanisms that lead to the interferon response um, are simplified or uh, exemplified by candle where proteotoxic stress, still waiting for a sensor, is triggering the integrated um, stress response and uh, an interferon response gene signature. Uh, sting autoactivation leads to constitutive or easily triggerable um, sting uh, activation and the production of the interferon signature and the accumulation of nucleic acids signal through the viral sensors uh, or the uh, DNA and RNA sensors and trigger an interferon response. Let me just see. Um, briefly, I won't go much into uh, treatment. This has been discussed. Um, the current um, treatment of these patients is blocking interferon signaling, um, uh, either through um, conceptualized through antibodies that block uh, signaling at the receptor level. Uh, these are still in clinical trial, but any follow-up has been um, successful in uh, meeting its primary goals in lupus and is expected to get uh, approved soon. But currently approved are JAK inhibitors that basically inhibit um, the signaling cascade of uh, interferons. And you can see on this slide, they are not specific to the type one interferon receptor, but they also block signaling of interferon um, gamma um, interleukins and then um, growth hormones, um, uh, sorry, growth hormone receptors or growth receptors um, that uh, are concerned for the development uh, of um, side effects. I won't show data, but uh, we actually see catch-up growth. So we do know that at the levels we need to treat patients, we are not inhibiting growth, which has been a major issue. So how do they do? Um, again, I won't say um, uh, a lot, but these conditions, uh, the candle actually is treated best with JAK inhibitors. We can actually normalize or significantly lower the interferon signature in actually all, this was a flare in, um, in actually all or most patients significantly and 50% normalize the uh, um, signature and go into a complete remission. These are usually patients with somewhat mitre disease. We can't really increase JAK inhibitors because of off-target effects. Um, in lupus, the interferon signature uh, stays elevated as an icardi Goodyear syndrome, um, but uh, Adeline van der Weer, who's been treating patients for a long time now with JAK inhibitors, has seen that there is acquisition uh, of milestones, which basically has not been present before they've been put on treatment. So it seems to ameliorate the um, uh, autoimmune uh, features and stabilize the disease. This slide shows that JAK inhibitors will likely not completely treat. CGAS is not only triggering type 1 interferons, but it actually also activates NF-kappa B and leads to the upregulation of IL-6 and TNF. So the, the uh, immune pathways that need to be controlled um, in patients are more diverse. And this actually points to a fact um, that sting may actually, uh, or that sting may be um, a quite uh, significant target uh, for treatment which would actually not work in candle patients. So um, the pathomechanisms overlap and what have we learned? 
Um, neutrophilic panniculitis is a hallmark uh, of candle, and um, there are a number of conditions that actually do present with neutrophilic panniculitis too, I'll briefly touch on. They are um, candle mimics. We've learned uh, another lesson, um, and that is that um, proteosome mutations are also found in patients with autism and developmental delay. And while the mutations that cause candle are in the core particles of the proteasome that has the degrading uh, proteolytic um, activity, um, the mutations that cause neurologic phenotypes are in the regulatory um, particle of the proteasome. So this is an exciting area, um, whether or not interferon in the CNS leads to, this, uh, to the neurodevelopmental um, delay and the neurodegenerative disease uh, needs to be evaluated. And obviously there's a lot of interest uh, in proteotoxic stress in other conditions such as Alzheimer's um, and other degenerative neurologic diseases. And what we've also learned is that nucleic acid metabolism with um, enrichment of nucleic acids in the cytoplasm is quite neurotoxic and actually causes uh, white matter disease through mechanisms that have only started uh, to be looked at. And there are a number of novel mutations all affecting nucleic acid metabolism that present with an icardigodia phenotype. So um, in fact, the uh, predictions that phenotypic similarities may actually be caused by the same pathways have recently been studied in COPA syndrome, um, in other monogenic um, interferonopathies, patients present with interstitial lung disease, poly uh, polyarthritis, many of them are rheumatoid factor positive and autoimmune phenotypes that can actually include glomerulonephritis. And uh, they do have autoantibodies, including CNP ANCA antibodies. You can see that they develop uh, rheumatoid factor positive erosive um, disease. And uh, the uh, lung disease has been thought uh, to be very similar uh, to SAVI with uh, patients having uh, chronically elevated interferon response gene signature. And it's recently been found that uh, COPI um, travels or traffics um, proteins from the ER to the Golgi and when mutated fails to bind to sting. And it actually needs to transport sting back into the ER to, um, to, um, to um, uh, uh, complete um, its, uh, to retrieve um, and uh, define, uh, refine uh, its action. And without it binding, yeah. sting continues to actually signal um, leading to interferon and uh, whether or not this is, it is quite likely that uh, sting overactivation is triggering the lung disease in these patients as well. Okay. Why is that important? Because using a sting inhibitor would actually help. Uh, DADA2 is caused by uh, adenosine yeah, diaminous uh, deficiency. And I think we have to actually, I'll, I'll briefly go through this. Um, uh, it is actually thought to have DNAs-like activity and the interferon signature that is actually seen in DADA2 patients whose peripheral disease is very similar to that of SAVI might be uh, caused by that. Furthermore, there is a, a pure cell uh, aplasia phenotype in patients yeah. who have absolutely no activity of ADA2, um, okay. suggesting that some activity of ADA2, some residual activity is necessary in order to cause the inflammatory phenotype that is responsive to TNF inhibition, but not uh, the bone marrow phenotype. I think we um, have quickly. Uh, I'll, yeah. I'll basically finish. Uh, I will not actually tell you about um, uh, to Nemo and Endas. Uh, Nemo Endas, uh, a novel disease, but will actually go to the end. Um, so um, we these conditions actually point to novel targets um, of treatment. And in summary, the autoinflammatory Mendelian diseases, including Savi, Candle, and HES, um, present with overlapping features and chronically elevated um, interferon signatures. However, um, the uh, signaling pathways are more complex. The overlapping features um, can be partially treated um, and propagate um, uh, immune um, and organ-specific inflammation and organ damage. And um, jack stat inhibitors do an okay job, um, are better in candle, hold the progression of lung disease and SAVI, and, um, um, and stabilize um, Icardi-Gaudia syndrome. Safety monitoring for viral reactivation uh, is recommended and necessary. And the intracellular pathways that lead to the interferon signature include ubiquitin system dysfunction, 
sting activation and nucleic acid metabolism dysfunction that correlate with clinical features and pathomechanisms and actually have become uh, targets for novel treatment. So thank you very much. 